Always a pleasure to say hello to Mr. Dan Donegan of Disturbed. Hello, Daniel. How What's are up, you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Was Daniel what the family screamed and yelled at you as a kid when you were in trouble? Yeah, it happened quite a bit. You know, I had an old, older brother and we used to fight all the time and <laughs> put holes in the wall by slamming bodies in there and wrestling each other. So, yeah, I, I was called Daniel quite a bit as a kid. Were you generally a good kid or were you a, a problem kid? I was an instigator. I was the baby of the family. So I always I knew how to push buttons. And, you know, I, I think I was overall pretty good. But I, I kind of I think my brother I kind of learned from some of his mistakes and I was just better at sneaking uh, um, and getting away with it a little bit more. Did you have an innocent look you would shoot when you were caught doing something and trying to get away with it? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I think just being the baby of the family, I, I don't know. I got away with a little bit more of them. So I don't know if it was a certain, certain look or not, but I was just, uh, like I said, a little bit more sneakier with <laughs> doing things and, and without their knowledge. And speaking of families, I think one of the few good things that came out of the, uh, you know, the COVID era, what I call the recent unpleasantness was the extra time you spent with your family, because I've met them countless times. And, and uh, you know, I know how tight you all are. Um, how is it now that you are gearing up to go away for an extended period of time after you've had the luxury of family around you for the last few years? Yeah, it, I mean, it's always challenging anytime you hit the road and you're spending time away. But, you know, now my kids, are, my, my daughter's a freshman in college now, so she's away away at the moment. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, over the summer, maybe maybe they could come out and join a little bit. You know, they have, you know, historically over the years they have. But, um, you know, I know as they get older, they got other things and friends and things to do and um so we'll see we kind of pick and choose our moments on when they could come out and, and join when uh you go out and do dad stuff uh historically probably when that when the you know um uh, a child is a little younger you're going to more grade school and high school stuff but uh, are you sort of an oddball there just because of what you do um here and there i i guess there's those times where you know i guess one of the perks of being in the business is the connections I may have for other people's concerts. So I get hit up a lot. Like when my daughter wants to go see, you know, Kanye West or Harry Styles or something like that. But I did take her when, cause she goes to university of Kentucky. And when I was down there visiting her um, early winter, um, five finger death punch was playing in town. So I did have her sway her to come with me to go see five finger while I was down there visiting her. Um, and then, you know, just it's been fun, especially like with, with my daughter being at this age of her just turning 19 and like she came home for the holidays and she, you know, we, I ended up going with just me and her for New Year's to uh, Cabo, you know, just to get away and get some nice weather. And then you know, with, with my son, you know, he's 15 now and he's, uh, he's busy with his buddies a lot. I mean, he's playing basketball or they just finished their basketball season. Um, but he's always running around with his friends and that. So I, for him, uh, he's 15, so he's got his his permit for driving, but I'm still the chauffeur at times of of just driving him around uh, to wherever he wants to go and that. So it's just the role I'm in right now. I wish I had more more uh, father son time with him, but you know he's at that age of just better things to do with his buddies. Now then, Disturbed has been doing, uh, or, or like last year, I, I caught you guys, um, but it was not like a extended tour it was more one-offs and very short runs as you guys prepare for what we'll we'll call like a real tour what are the challenges now because i believe that you know the touring community is still stretched pretty thin in terms of staffing and uh equipment so tell me about logistically gearing up putting uh disturbed back out there again um, well, right now we're at the stage of going over production ideas and, and finalizing crew and that too, as you mentioned, I mean, obviously with COVID, um, it just, you know, obviously affected the whole world, but in the music world, you know, a lot of our crew with most artists out there, you know, these guys had to find new careers, um, for, for a bit. So it's kind of hard to get everybody back, um, cause they had such a major change in, in their lives and that, um. So we're trying to finalize some of those some of those guys and see if we can get them to return 
uh, full time now that we have, like you said, a, a full proper tour. Um, so that, that, that's been challenging, you know, because we lost lost a few guys who just had a different career path uh, over the past couple of years. But uh, the core, the main core of, of the crew and everybody, I think, are pretty much on board. So now we're just trying to, you know, put together a, a great set list and something that's going to give the fans a little bit of, of every album, the, the catalog throughout the years and, you know, play obviously some some of the newer songs off this new album, Divisive, and and give them a taste of some of that new material as well. Um, so it's a, it's a good position to be in that wise, that, that way with the set list of being able to kind of maybe mix it up a little bit. We have such a deep catalog now and and just kind of maybe have a couple songs, aud audibles to where we might swap out every night and just to change it up and have it a little bit more variety. So, you know, we're we're just excited to finally get get back out there and have this proper tour. Because like you said, with, with last year and even in fall of 2021, we only did a handful of shows then. So we haven't really done a, a proper tour since before COVID. So um, I think we're all, you know, fired up and excited about it to really, you know, hit the ground running and and be able to stay out on the road for a while. Because those handful of shows was just a tease to us too. You know, we do a festival here or there. We go out for a week or two and then we get excited again. And then there was no no more dates to to follow up with. So I think we're all just ready to get out there and, and do a proper tour. When uh, you have those production conversations with uh, with your tour staff, whose job is it to to make ideas reality? Like I want the piano to catch fire. <laughs> I want to fly through the air. It's you know these are not things that like you pick up off the shelf at Walmart or something. You know these right. things have to be customized. Tell me about how this stuff becomes real. Well. That's that's the funny thing because we can we'll we'll dream up like the big ideas like that and then we'll have either a, a you know production manager or our management and and guys bring us back down to reality of what of what we should do. I mean, yeah, the the piano catching on fire that was an idea I had pre COVID and luckily we were able to pull that off and make it affordable to pull it off, but. Like I said, we'll, we'll just dream up these these big ideas and, and they'll reel us in. And then we kind of uh, cherry pick which ones we could incorporate, which make the most sense. And trying to have that wow factor, too. I mean, we, we've never been a crazy over the top, uh, you, know, you know, production, but we kind of want to give a visual show the best we can, too. And, and especially, I guess, historically, we've been known for even our song Inside the Fire. We've always had a big pyro moment in that song so it's kind of hard for us not to still have that wow factor when we're used to seeing you know the the look of shock on the fans faces when we do something that they haven't seen before with the way we were using pyro and you know we're not doing it in a romstein kind of way they're the kind of masters of it but you know it's always fun when we could add kind of some of those elements i mean there's nothing cooler than seeing some cool pyro blowing off uh, at a big rock show, it's a, you know something we always liked as as a kid going to concerts and seeing that. So we try to bring a little bit to that to the show. How deep do you or um, the other guys get involved in the design of tour merchandise and the such? You mentioned Five Finger Death Punch before. Most of that stuff, and I, I think it's general knowledge now, but um, Zoltan designs a lot of that stuff himself how deep do you guys get into the process working with your people with the merchandise yeah. um you know they we're not really artists ourselves so we can you know we have you know a merchandise company that presents ideas to us and then it's just really us saying what we like or what we don't like and i mean they're in the world of of merchandise and they know better than us of what works too i mean we may say the only advice we give is, Hey, you know, it's hockey season. Let's have a disturbed hockey Jersey. That's about the extent of our creativity when it comes to um, the art or the, what kind of shirt to put out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, there might be a few things obviously with our artwork over the years and with our, you know, mascot, the, the guy that we use has always been a visual uh, thing that has always connected with the fans and that. So you know, we have a great art department and art direction that that's, they've always come up with with cool ideas. So there's really not a whole lot that we that we pass on or say no to. You know, we kind of put it in our hands to come up with the 
you know, the creative side when it comes to the merch. Is there anything from the few that you've passed on that you remember as being just horribly bad? Um, I can't name it specifically, but I'm sure there were there, to where we're like, ah, you know, that's, you know, but then it's all, I guess, personal taste and preference. You know, there's something that we think isn't all that exciting. And then, but we're like, ah, whatever, put it out there anyways. And then it's something that becomes a, a, a popular item on the road. And they'll know, I mean, not, you know, it, it's kind of, maybe choosing a handful of shirt ideas and they put it out there and the merch company knows if something's not taking off and, and people aren't gravitating towards it, then they discontinue it and move on to the, the next item. But um, yeah, I can't, I can't name one specific thing to where I was totally cringing over. Okay. Um, good. Well, that, that's good. I think probably. Yeah. Um, do you recall what your first custom guitar pick was? Hmm. Let's see what was it that's a good question i'm trying to I've, I've changed a few over the years just the size of the the pick and i'm trying to remember the i think it was probably kind of basic maybe with just the the original disturbed mascot just that two-dimensional sinister smile you know smiley face guy on there it was probably just a black and white pick with that and maybe a signature on the back but that might have been in the early stages of the game i can't remember if it was the very first one though who do you uh, who, who do you have designed the picks and how do you get them made? Um, now it's a, my my guitar tech. He'll send them out. He he kind of does everything. I, I you know I can't even change my strings anymore. He's been doing it for me <laughs> for, for years. You know it's kind of bad that I'm kind of I'm so used to you know relying on him to kind of <laughs> take care of everything for me. So a lot of times with each album cycle, I, I usually might just give him you know some either a logo or a signature or some kind of design off the new artwork. And then, you know, he'll, he'll take it from there and he'll send it in and they'll, you know, mock up a, a, a version of it and that, and we'll see what works, but yeah, that's usually in his hands. Now, uh, every now and then, particularly on social media, I will see like an ancient, very early picture of disturbed <laughs> uh, you know, start to make the rounds. And I would be curious if there's like a real treasure tre uh, treasure chest yeah. of pictures, videos that have not been seen yet that maybe uh, will make their way into some sort of, uh, you know, media, perhaps a book of some kind. Because at this point, you guys have so many stories, so much material. And I, I think it would make a compelling sort of coffee table book. Yeah, I mean, I... I I'm a hoarder when it comes to disturbed memorabilia and stuff from the beginning. I have a lot of great stuff that I've saved over the years and uh, pictures or notes. And I think I even have a post-it note from the first time me and David talked on the phone before we even met in person when we were starting to audition singers. And I think I had, a, you know, maybe jotted down his phone number or might have been a pager at that time. I don't know. It's pager. <laughs> Uh, this is going back in, in the 90s, you know, so 1996 when we got him. Um, and I just have a lot of stuff saved up. It's mostly pictures and flyers and all stuff like that. Um, we do have a lot of VHS tape videos that uh, Mikey, our, our drummer, his sister used to videotape a lot of our shows when we were just coming up. And I know that, that some of that video, I've seen some of the footage over the years, but I know it's probably you know, sitting in a, in a box somewhere, maybe at his sister's house. You got to get that stuff cataloged before the, right. the quality degrades anymore. I mean, uh, that that's real treasure, even if you might cringe at the haircuts or something. You oh, know? my God. Oh, we went through many phases of that. <laughs> me, me, probably the most. You know, I've gone through many different phases of of hair colors and lengths and, and every crazy stuff. I it's kind of laughable. I think my kids like to laugh at me at, at anything they've seen. They still laugh at me now. So yeah, you know, e even though you're a big rock star, you're still dad. So you're you're to be you know run down for that. That that doesn't change family to family. I don't think. Yeah, I, I think my kids have always. I mean, this is all they've ever known. They grew up with, with dad being a musician and, and being on the road, but they always kind of find ways to make fun of me and, and keep me grounded. And one time that uh, comes to mind was when they were much younger, we were at Hooters for lunch one time and we're going, or they see, I guess my picture was hanging up on the wall. How when Hooters, I don't know if they still do that, but they had all the, 
you know, they have a lot of celebrities and actors and rock stars and pictures of them hung up on the wall. Well, there was a picture of me on the wall with some of the Hooters girls and they're like, dad, the picture's right by the bathroom. It's not a big deal. Like, (laughs) okay, that's, that's the best I can do a picture over by the bathroom. Right. (laughs) With the extended downtime you had, um, were you able to stay in pretty good shape? And the reason I ask this is you do some of the best stage jumps in rock and roll, you know, lava floor. I think you like to uh, (laughs) caption the pictures. Are, 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 and this is a dead serious question. Are, do you have to like train to get back into shape for good leaps again? You know, it, it's at this point, it's just driven off of adrenaline. <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel it in the knees a little bit more. I, you know, I was a little bit of, of an athlete when I was a kid and, you know, I had a couple banged up, you know, I have a, one bad knee, but in those moments, you know, I think in it, it's still between me and, you know, John Moyer and that, and, and his jumps too, we kind of, you know, compete a little bit or take shots at each other. But, you know, I got a, I got a few years on John, so I'm not trying to make excuses, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep up with him, you know, and see who could uh, out jump each other a little bit, but hanging in there doing our best to try to still get off the ground a little bit, but um, there's usually a noticeable difference from the start of a tour and the end of the tour. You know, once we get our stage legs actually underneath us and playing a bit, then I like to think that I'm, I'm still, you know, progressing as the tour goes on and, and getting back into some of those jumps, but uh, trying our best. I don't know how much longer I, I can, I'm not really leaping off the drum riser anymore as much, maybe just more off the stage, but it's fun. Like I said, in those moments of, of just the adrenaline taking over, that's that kind of what drives us. You uh, touched on the uh, putting the set list together a little bit earlier. I would be very curious to know what sort of feedback you have gotten uh, on uh, on divisive uh, so far, even though you haven't really been out to uh, to mingle too much. Right. I mean, we've only when last year when we did those handful of shows, we've only played uh, besides Hey You being the first single. And then Unstoppable, we put out as like a teaser track is a is a. a um instant grad track um just before the album was released so those were the only two songs that we've played so far live so now this time around obviously with the album out we'll be able to play our, our newest single bad man and, and and a few others but um the feedback's been great from from everything we've done from um what i've seen online or press that we've done i think the fans uh you know we were ready to kind of go back to the, a little bit of the heavier side of disturbed again after especially coming out of covid and and our previous album with evolution being half acoustic and half electric i think we were ready to get back to to the core of the band of having more that you know still melodic but still but bringing back more the animalistic side of david and just some of the heavier riffs and syncopation so and then working with our new producer drew folk so that really uh, was a, a great marriage to get him on board. And and we were all just ready f- and fired up and ready to kind of deliver something a little bit more aggressive. And Bad Man, from the very first time I heard it, I thought, well, there's a tune that's going to fit in very well in a live set. Yeah, I think so. That's one I'm definitely looking forward to playing uh, for the first time. Um, it's just driving. You know, it just it was a, a song that kind of came out of nowhere. We were in the studio already started the recording process and then one day I came in into the room one morning I came and start tracking guitars that day and I just switched gears and I said to our producer you know what I just feel really inspired and and feel like playing and just feel like coming up with something new and, and improvising and I said you know just throw it throw a beat at me give me something that's just kind of driving and it was really the first riff that came out like within seconds and then as I was further fine tuning the idea you know david was just digesting it and then coming up with a, a melody like right away so it was it was a quick one as soon as he he heard it david's always been really quick with his his melodies he could improvise stuff uh immediately he could come up with you know 20 different versions of it and that was like the first thing out of both of us that just came real quick and uh lyrically it's a um uh, a very apropos song for these times, unfortunately. Yeah, right. Honest so, to God. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and typically when he's, you know, scatting, when he's working out these melody ideas, it's just always 
that scat obviously he doesn't have lyrics immediately so it usually takes time before he knows what he's going to write about but instantly when he had that kind of syncopated and that that two syllable you know thing when the chorus hit the first thing he said was bad man it was just probably one of the first times where an actual lyric idea just came out um and especially when we were writing it at the the state of the the world at that time um it was just something that was on his mind and kind of uh evolved from there well dan it's always great to speak to you i cannot wait to see you guys out doing uh you know like the festival stuff i saw you do is great but it's not the same as a full concert tour set with a full production so uh very happy for you and uh, i will see you soon please give my best to your family 